this story we're going to read today, it's the end of the book of Ruth. And we're going to talk about a guy named Boaz. And I want all the ladies in the house to say Ruth with a high pitch. Say Ruth. Yeah. Say it again. Say Ruth. Yeah. Very good. And all the fellows, I want you to say Bo on three. One, two, three. Bo. Say it again. One, two, three. Bo. Very good. So this story is about a, a guy named Boaz and a woman named Ruth. And in this story, today we're going to see Boaz handle his business. Let me do a little review. There was a woman named Naomi. Everyone say Naomi. Naomi was a Jewish lady. She lived in and went to Moab with her husband and her two sons. And they went to Moab and, they all, and the two sons got married. And then over a course of time, her husband died and the two men died and left her with two daughters-in-laws. And one was Ruth. So Naomi decides, I want to go back to Bethlehem where I'm from. And Ruth, you could stay in Moab. But Ruth says, no, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem with you. I'm going to leave my gods behind in Moab and I'm going to leave my land. So Ruth goes back to, ne- to Bethlehem with Naomi. They lead their other sister-in-law back, and they go to Bethlehem. Now, Ruth is a Moabite. She's not a Jew. But by faith, she says, my pe- your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. So she abandons the false God for the one true God. They get to Bethlehem, and they didn't have any husbands. They didn't have any money. So Ruth says, I'm going to go glean in the field, which meant that when someone was harvesting or farming, they can go behind them, and if anything fell on the ground, they could pick it up because that was a provision in the Old Testament that poor people can walk behind the farmers and pick up anything that fell on the ground for free. So she goes out into the field, and she's on her hands and knees grubbing in the ground, and, and, and she's getting all this free stuff. And Boaz, a tall, dark, and handsome brother, comes in the field. He owns the land, and he says, yo, who's that sweet thing over there? And he asked the guys who work for him, and they said, that's Ruth. She came back from Moab with Naomi. Her husband died, and she's been working all day long out here. She rested a little while, but she's been out here all day long. And so Boaz says, listen, I want you guys over here not to bother her. And if she wants some water, tell her to go over there. And all the women that work for me, I want her to stay close to uh, them so she could be safe. So Boaz goes over to Ruth. And this is how he met her for the first time. He says, hey, what's up, young sweet thing? She says, how you doing? And he says, listen, I've been checking you out. And I got the word on you, and I hear you're a virtuous woman. So listen, see those guys over there? You don't have to worry about them. See those women? If you stay near them, they'll keep you safe. And if you want some water, it's over there for you to drink. And she, the Bible says she bowed down on her face at his feet and said, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, you're so nice to me. Why are you being so good to me? I'm a foreigner, oh, my goodness. And he says, listen, the reason I'm being so nice to you because all the people in the town know that you are a godly woman. You are worth the effort. And she goes, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So what she does is she goes back to Naomi that night. She says, guess what, Naomi? I met this guy named Boaz, and he's in off, and, and he let me glean in his field. And he says, I can come back anytime I want. And Naomi gets an idea. Bing. Naomi says, let me tell you something. That guy can be your kinsman redeemer. Everyone say kinsman. kinsman. Say redeemer. redeemer. Say kinsman. kinsman. Say redeemer. Here's how a kinsman redeemer worked. If you as a woman lost your husband and therefore you had no children, you would lose your land. If you lost your husband, your brother-in-law or a next in kin could marry you. You have a son and that son would inherit the land back in the family. So you had a kinsman redeemer, a relative which would marry you so you could redeem back the land or property you lost because you lost your husband. And so what Naomi says is, Ruth, this guy is your relative. He could be a kinsman redeemer. So here's what you need to do. You need to go up. He's going to be on the, on the, on the threshing floor, this hill, and where the wind blows, he's going to be up there harvesting his wheat, and he's going to lay down and go to sleep. So what happens when he lays down and goes to sleep, I want you to crawl under, you know, first, you know, crawl under and, and lay at his feet. But the first thing you got to do is you got to take a bath because you're kind of funky. And I want you to change your clothes and I want you to put some smell good on. The Bible does say that, by the way. It says, wash yourself, change your clothes, and put some, uh, anoint yourself, put some uh, smell good on. So she does all that. She gets all purdy up. And then he goes to sleep and she crawls underneath the covers at his feet. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and sees a woman laying at his feet. And he says, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to keep it real, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> he, says, he says, who are you? She says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing. This is his wing. 
What's under your wing? Your rib. What's your rib? Your wife. Eve was taken from man's rib. I don't know if you remember the story about the little boy. He was learning about the Adam and Eve story in school. And he learned that Eve came from the rib. And, and about a week later, he was on the floor laying, rolling around, holding his side. Kind of, oh, ma, ma, ma. His, his mother said, are you sick? He said, no, I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> it's a little jokey joke just for, for, for free. You just, just a little freebie. You can take that home and use it. On the <laughs> So she says, take me under your wing. I want to be your riblet. You are my relative. You could be my kinsman redeemer. He got it. He understood. I'm your relative. Your husband's dead. You have land that you lost. And I am a relative. But what the problem was, he wasn't the next in, kin, in line. There was someone who was a closer relative who had first priority over him. So what he is going to do is handle his business, and he's going to go about the proper way of getting this woman to be his wife. Now, here you are. Last week we had, um, uh, how many of y'all were here last week? Right, raise your hand. You remember the altar call was up the aisle, all the way into the thing, into the vomitorium. And same thing over here. All these guys, mostly guys making commitments, and, and a lot of it was we were talking about sexual purity. We were talking about pornography. We were talking about lust. We were talking about adultery. We were talking about fornication. We were talking about all that stuff last week. And people were coming here, and last week, every service was jam-packed with people at the altar, confessing sin. Okay, fine, but now what? We want to make sure we close the deal. So as we close this book out, we want to follow Boaz's example of closing the deal, making sure we follow through on what we say. Amen? Amen? Look at, look at, look at number one in your notes. Number one in your notes. The first thing you need to do is take immediate and well-planned action. Immediate and well-planned action. Chapter 4, verse 1. Uno. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer... Of whom Boaz had spoken came and by, and Boaz said, Turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. So what did Boaz do? Boaz said, Ruth, I'm going to do what I said. He goes to the city gate, which is what you see behind me. The city gate is where the leaders of the community sat, and it's where business deals were de and decisions were made. And so he goes to the city gate and he says, you are the, the redeemer closer than me. You are the kinsman that's closer than me. You have first priority on Ruth. So come over here and sit down. And you guys are the elders. You're going to decide this deal and make sure we make a, a good deal. You sit down. You're going to be the witnesses. So what he does, he handles his business. Okay? And look what it says next. It says in verse 2, he took the ten men of the city and said, sit down here. They sat down. Verse 3, he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and then I come after you. So basically what Boaz was doing was saying, I am going to do this properly. I'm going to do this biblically, but I'm going to do it and get it done. So here's my first question to you. What commitment about your spiritual life, your sexuality, your romance life, your relationships, what commitment did you make in the last couple of weeks, three weeks, or do you need to make? You heard me talk last week about pornography. You heard me talk last week about sexual sin and living together and sleeping around and blah, 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 blah. Commit adultery and fornication and, 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 and lust and et cetera. What commitment have you made that you need to keep? How many of y'all are married? Raise your hand. Okay, if you're married, we talked about fellas washing your woman's feet, submitting to your wife, encouraging your wife, loving your wife. We talked about that. We talked about... Doing the dishes, vacuuming the house, doing the laundry. You're thinking, man, what is that going to do? You do it and find out. She'll be like, hey, look at my Mr. Maid. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me. 
We talked about, we talked about actually washing your woman's feet, asking her, how can I bless you? How can I make your life more comfortable? And let me tell you something. You do that to them, they'll be doing it to you. But we talked about not saying bow at my feet out of, out of authority, but you, you bow first, they bow second. As the leader of the house, you lead as the example of the servant. And watch what happens. How many of y'all are not married? Y'all got all kind of issues we need to talk about. <laughs> all kind, just, we, I don't have time to go through all the stuff that, that we got to deal with. But y'all know all the sexual sin that the devil is luring you into. That you need to say, Lord, I just need to be pure. What's your plan? Who are you, who's going to hold you accountable to? What are you going to try to do? You're going to try to get off pornography? You're going to try to get off, uh, uh, stop sleeping together? You're going to try to be pure with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wannabe boyfriend, girlfriend? What is your plan? Who's going to hold you accountable? Where are you writing it down? If you do not plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. If you do not write a plan and have someone hold you accountable to it, you probably won't do it. And, and like all of us in this room, including myself, we can look back on 2007, 2006, and look at all these things we always wanted to do, and we never do it. One of the reasons, we don't have a plan. We have no one in our, in our life to ask us and challenge us and get in our face and say, well, how are you going to make this happen? I met some business people recently who have incredible experience, incredible Wisdom, far beyond what I would ever do. It's because some of the things, one guy organized a business that was all over the world and he oversaw the whole globe. Go figure. The whole globe. I said, you manage the whole planet for this business? The whole planet. And these guys, God has brought these people into my life to help me do what I do better, and we sit down, we have strategies, and they're holding me accountable, giving me homework, we're writing it down. It's very formal. And because we have a schedule, and because they are in my grill, and because they have, they have no reason to tell me nothing but the truth, the whole truth, so help them, God, it is such a good process. It is transforming my life. Who in your life can get in your face in love and challenge you in something you need to change in. Submit yourself to that and watch what happens. But if you just want to do your own thing and kind of float around, that's exactly what your spiritual life will be. Whatever. Don't do that. When we do the fast, oh, do the fast. Do the fast. Oh, if I don't eat for a week, I'm going to die. Let me tell you something. You got 401K, Roth IRA, you know, all kind of retirement food up in here, okay? You can go for a long time. Okay. This is November over here, December over here. Trust me. If someone cuts you, the whole 7-Eleven will fall out, Okay. Just trust. And, but get someone to hold you accountable. Say, listen, I'll, I'm going to do this fast. Because if you don't do the fast, for the most part, you're just punking out. Unless you have some medical thing. If you've got a medical thing, you can still fast television. You could definitely fast coffee. But my point is this. Make a plan and get someone to hold you accountable to that plan, and then you will get it done. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also must acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in the inheritance. And the Redeemer says, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. So here's what happened. Boaz said, come over here, fella, and come over here, elders, please. There's a woman over here and there's some land. So what you need to do if you want to get the land, you could buy the land, but you also got to marry Ruth. Now, here's how the law went. If you marry Ruth and you have a son, that son would take the land. And so what this guy said is, I don't want to do that because I might risk my inheritance. Why am I going to go through all that headache just so her son can get the land? Look at number two in your notes. Number two in your notes, surrender your grip on your earthly desires. You need to surrender your grip. On your earthly desires. 
What he said was, I don't want to risk losing what I work for in the name of this woman. In other words, I'm not, you know, I'm not into that. And what Boaz, what Boaz said is, look, if you want to buy the land, you have to marry Ruth. Now, let me tell you about Ruth. Her breath is kicking like Jackie Chang, okay? And she ain't really all that cute and her hair's all nappy and she got stuff living in her hair. You, you, you don't want to. The reason he was telling her this, even though he wasn't making it up, but the reason he was telling her this is because he wanted to marry her. Because he wanted to be the kinsman redeemer. But when this guy found out that he may risk losing his stuff, he backed away. When God tells you, I want to use you, I want to I do something through your life, and then you find out you might have to give up something, a lot of times you say no. And you just cheated yourself out of a big blessing in exchange for a little blessing. There's a monkey called the Gibbons monkey. When you hunt the Gibbons monkey, you can't just walk through the woods and shoot it or throw a net on it. They're too fast, too slick. They see real good. They hear real good. And so the guy who hunts the Gibbons monkey, he takes these coconuts and he hollows them out. And the coconut has a chain on it, and at the chain has a spike that he nails into the base of a tree. And he puts rice in the coconut, and he puts it on the ground, and he puts them all over the forest. And then he walks away. Then the monkeys come down, and they see the coconut, and they say, it looks real good. Then they can smell the rice. They say, it smells real good. Then they hit the coconut, and they can hear, they can hear the rice, and it sounds real good. So they stick their hand in the coconut, and they say, it feels real good. Isn't there a whole bunch of stuff in life that gets you in trouble that looks good, smells good, feels good, and sounds good? <laughs> Say amen, fellas. That's right. They're dangerous. <laughs> Tear you up. <laughs> Ladies, the same thing for the fellas, too. You know, it goes both ways, okay? But you know what I'm saying, right? So, 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 the, so, the, so the monkey puts his hand in the coconut, and he says, I got what I want. And he tries to get his hand out, but he got a fistful of rice. He can't get it through the hole. So he, he tries to break the coconut. But it's a, it's a fake metal coconut. He tries to bite the chain, can't bite the chain. He tries to pull the stake out of the ground, and he can't pull it out. So he's going, ah, ah, ah. And he's trying to pull it out of the ground, bite the chain, break the coconut. Ah, ah, ah. And all these monkeys are all over the floor. Ah, 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 ah. And then the guy who's hunting them just walks by like this. Bam, shoots him. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> That's real funny. <laughs> All the monkeys had to do was let go of the rice. They would have run up to the tree and would have got safe. You know what God's saying to you? I want you to let go of the rice. And some of y'all just like, God's like, let go. I don't want to let go. I like this. But I got a blessing for you at the top of the tree. And it's better than what you got at the, on the ground. You got to trust him. This guy, he didn't believe that. He says, I don't want to risk my inheritance, so I'm going to hold on to it, and I'm going to reject my relationship with Ruth. Little did he know he was rejecting the opportunity to be an ancestor of Jesus Christ himself, as we're going to see in a minute. Little do you know that what God's calling you to is so much bigger than you know. Some of y'all are here for the first time. Some of y'all are not saved. You do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you think, what is all this church Jesus stuff about? Let me tell you, it's bigger than you know. Without Christ, here's what you do. You get a job, you get a girlfriend, a boyfriend, you try to have as much fun as you can, make as much money as you can, retire and die, and that's it. You have no eternal purpose, and you have no idea why you're on this earth. With Jesus, he opens up your eyes. Bam. And now you know who you are. And over time, who you are and why you are becomes more and more clear. He gives you supernatural power, and he shows you your purpose. And your life is not only between the time you're born and the time you die. That's only the beginning of eternity for you. And he opens up your eyes. And what the devil doesn't want you to know that God has a better life for you than he has. What the devil wants you to do is hold on to that rice so he can kill you. And he wants you to have a competition with all the other monkeys holding on to that rice. God says, let go of the rice. Forget the monkeys. Go up the tree. And that's what this guy, he, said he didn't want to do that. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 7. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. He took off his shoe. 
Now, some of the some of the customs in the Bible, people aren't completely clear on why they did what they did. But what happened was here is they took up their shoe and made the deal by exchanging a shoe. Now, one of the reasons we think they did that is because when you walked on something, it was your way of claiming the land. In other words, God told Abraham, I want you to go to the promised land, and everywhere your foot treads, that is your land. So actually, he was claiming the land by walking on it. This is my land. This is my land. This is my land. And so his foot was actually stamping his name on the ground and claiming it as his. When Moses stood before God in the burning bush, what did God tell him? Take off your shoe. Why? This is not your land. You are not claiming. This is my land. So take off your shoes and stand before me barefoot and respect me. Now, I went to, to, to live, in the, live in the desert. I went to spend the night in the desert for one night, 24 hours, just me in a tent. Now, I am not a camper. I'm more of a Marriott, Hyatt, Omni kind of brother. <laughs> you know, cable, high def, king size, blah, da, bing, blah, da, blam. Comfort. I ain't about going out in the, in the woods, but... Since I'm trying to be a spiritual man, I fasted a couple of days and went out to the woods, uh, to the desert, uh, with this other mountain man friend of mine who is a mountain man. He's like, you know, that's what he does. And so he says, I got all the gear. All you need to do is show up. I'm thinking, I got to have something, nothing. Just bring your clothes and some water, and, and you're going to be, I'm going to push you by yourself, and I'm going to be by myself. I'll leave you for 24 hours. I'm like scared to death, bigger punk. I'm just a punk. So I'm asking him the whole time driving up there, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? <clears throat> He's like, just worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. So we get out there <clears throat> in Borrego. Now, Borrego, California, actually, is the climate of Israel. And the desert is the climate of where Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 nights and 40 days. It's really very similar. So we went out to Borrego. I don't even know where we went. We, I said, you know, I'm thinking we could just sleep anywhere. He says, yeah, I'm going to drive off on some side road, and I'm just going to make a tent and leave you there, and then I'll come back the next day. I was like, man, this sounds really shaky. <laughs> so, I'm like, all right, I'm game. So I, we fasted and got all, you know, prayed up, and we drive out, and he, we stop on this little a side road. I'm thinking, you know, is this okay? They put the side road out. He makes the tent, and I'm like, what about heat? What about this? What about, he's like, you know, you'll figure it out. I'm like, no, I don't want to have to figure it out. Tell me now. And he's like, you know, we, and then he was gone. <laughs> so for like four hours, I was, I, I, I was just like, you know, you know, scared. <laughs> And then the night came, and I got real scared. And, and at night, you, you can see the stars. I mean, you can see, the, I literally watched the constellation move because I never went to sleep because I was so scared all night. Matter of fact, I heard the coyotes talking about me. <laughs> you think I'm lying? Oh, there's a brother over here. Oh, 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 he's scared. I can sense it. Oh, 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 oh. Hundreds of them. And I'm like this. I didn't know if they were over there, over there. So I was petrified. All the wind was blowing. It was and it was pitch black. Would you be scared? And so I, 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 here's how I prayed all night. Because I knew someone was going to walk up behind me. I had no sleep. I didn't get no rest. It was really kind of a waste of time. But I did it anyway. But. And God didn't say anything to me other than stay awake. And um, <laughs> so I took my shoes off because I wanted to see what it was like to walk without your shoes in the desert. You take your shoes off in the desert, here's how you walk. <laughs> Why? Because the, 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 the rocks are sharp. There's thorns from cactuses or cacti. It is, you have to walk very carefully. What God told Abraham is walk before me and be blameless. He told Moses, take off your shoes. Be careful. Don't be careless. This is not where you, this is not yours. So with, what happened here, they, when he took off the shoe, they were saying, here's all my property. Here's my lease, my ownership on my land, and I'm giving it to you. Let's keep reading. Verse 9, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have brought, bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malon 
And Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from, from his gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Look what it says in your notes, number three. Do not rest until the job is complete. Do not rest until the job is complete. I would bet you, many of you, I hope, would come to church every week and leave here going, I'm going to change. I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to pray some more. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to be a man of God. Or, I'm going to be a woman of God. I'm going to change. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what he said. Yeah, that was good. And then by the time you get to your car <laughs> and you turn on the music and you're like, hey. And you get home, you turn on your TV, give, give me a beer, <laughs> and it's like, what did you do tonight? Uh, oh, I went to church. And you forget. You forget. And then you go another week, and by Thursday, you're all jacked up, and you go, I got to go to church again. And you get saved all over again in your mind. Why do you live like that? Boaz says, you know, I'm going to handle my business, I'm going to do it right, and he, he married the girl. Ruth, they had a baby. And look what happened. Look at verse 16. Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and, he, and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying the son has been born to Naomi, which really was her grandson. They named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David who was the ancestor of Jesus Christo. One of Jesus' names is the son of David. One of Jesus' names is the son of David. God told David, you will never cease to have a son on the throne, and I will give him a throne that lasts forever. Jesus he was talking about. Ruth is in the ancestry of Jesus Christ. If you read Matthew 1, it goes through his ancestry, ancestry his genealogy, and there's Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. And Boaz was a man that he, she met in the field. And the other guy, we don't even know his name, he gave up the right to be this guy. Because he, he, he didn't see it. He didn't have faith. He didn't have vision. Here you are. Jesus Christ, like Boaz, is our kinsman redeemer. Everyone say kinsman. Redeemer. Say redeemer. redeemer. Say kinsman. Redeemer. Say redeemer. redeemer. Kinsman redeemer. Kinsman means relative. My next in kin or my kin. Redeemer is someone who redeems something for you on your behalf, buys something back. Your kinsman redeemer is a relative who marries, in this context, who marries you so you can get back something you lost. Boaz was the model kinsman redeemer for Jesus Christ. Why? One, here he was a very wealthy man reaching out to a very poor pagan woman. Here Jesus Christ is not only wealthy, he's royalty, he's deity. Comes down, humbles himself, and becomes a man, making himself kin. Because he was human, he's now our brother. And he came out to reach to a very poor pagan people who don't know him, sinners. And he says, if we marry, which is being born again, then I will redeem you to myself and I will also redeem your land. When God cursed the earth in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned. One of the symbols of the curse was thorns on, a, on plants. If you ever see a thorn, that's there because God cursed the earth because of sin. A thorn is representative of sin. And it's representative of the curse on the earth. Weeds as well. When Jesus died on the cross, they put thorns on his head. One, it represented sin, but it also represented that he was also dying to redeem the planet because there's going to be a new earth and new heavens where you will grab a rose and there will be no thorns, where a lion and a lamb will lay down together, where children can play with poisonous snakes and nothing will happen. So when Christ was doing, he's redeeming not only a man, he was redeeming the earth. He was reclaiming land just like Boaz was reclaiming land. So Jesus Christ is saying to you, here you are, Ruth, crawling around on the ground, 
gleaning, just getting what you can, trying to just make it every day. How many times have you ever heard, I'm just trying to make it every day? That's what she was doing, just trying to struggle through. And Boaz, Jesus Christ, comes and says, you know what? You can come live in a big house with me. I can hook you up. I'll be your husband. I bless you. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to cleanse you of your sin, renew your mind, and show you a whole new way of living. You think your finances got you down? Finances are nothing. God can fix that. You never had a good man? God can fix that. He be your good man. You never had a good woe man? God can fix that. He can do so much in your life. Where even when the things happen in your life that you think are bad, I don't know if you, you saw the Chargers game, the, the quarterback on the other team was a guy named John Kittner. John Kitten is a sold-out Christian. He was actually here at church this morning and came up on this stage and gave a greeting to the 8 o'clock service. I did chapel for them last night, but I had my fingers crossed. That's why they lost, but that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> did a chapel for the Detroit Lions, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I got my fingers crossed behind my back, and I'm re-holding the blessing. But uh, <laughs> I'm only kidding. But he came here this morning, and he, and he was, you know, I've known him for like, I don't know, 10, 12 years but he is a sold-out believer. Yeah, they lost the game. And yeah, he, he, from what I saw, didn't have a good game. But you know what? That does not define him. That doesn't define him. He, he is a son of God, and God has a call on his life, and he has a ministry that he's going to do in Tacoma, Washington. I'm trying to get him to move here and tell him God ain't speaking to him about that. He's speaking to him about coming here. But that's another story. But, but, that, but that's not his life. That's not who he is. Whether well, it's a good game, bad game, and we, we like to criticize people when they don't do well, that is irrelevant. That's just what he does. It's not who he is. Your failure in life, your ups and downs at school, it's not who you are. Who you are is your relationship with God. And so God is reaching out to you saying, let me renew your life. Let me give you a real purpose. I used to do cocaine, and I used to do cocaine right down the street. And the guy I used to do cocaine with right down the street here in Point Loma, that's how I was introduced to Point Loma, cocaine. And the guy who lived right down the street got arrested. He came out of his house. He was playing. He was a linebacker for the Chargers at the time. Comes out of his house. Whoop, whoop. They come right on him, cameras and everything. Cameras and the police at the same time. Whole sting operation set up. He was my boy on my left. My boy on my right got arrested as well. I was next. And the guy who was following me, getting ready to bust me, still works for the San Diego Chargers to this day. Anytime you see any of the coaches all your life walk off the field and there's a, an old, older African-American guy with white hair next to the coach, next time you see a game, he's right there. He's security. He was there when I was there and we're still friends. And every time I see him, he goes, I was going to arrest you. I was going to arrest you. <laughs> and me and him are like that. And he goes, but God did something in your life. I got saved, started going to church. He started following me to church, thinking I was buying my drugs at church. <laughs> Gospel truth. I had no idea any of this was happening. I was this close to having my life ruined. You know, God snatched me out and said, I have something for you to do. And check this out. When I was playing football, they would ask me to go speak. Uh, we need a speaker to go down and speak to this fifth grade class. Uh-uh, I ain't going. I'm not a speaker. I'll take pictures. <laughs> he said, no, we, we, you need to go address this kindergarten class in graduation. Uh-huh, I ain't going to speak nowhere. Can you imagine me? I don't speak. You know why? I was blind. Some of y'all are blind. What God wants you to do is the last thing you think, but yet he can make you so blessed. But you got to say yes to him. Two people in this room that I want to talk to. One, you do not have Jesus as your Savior, and he wants to be your Savior. He wants to be your kinsman redeemer, your husband. You need to say yes to him. The other person, you made a commitment and you need to take a step to really solidify that you're going to do it. But one prayer for both of y'all. We're going to have you pray. We're going to have you stand up. And, and, and we're going to have you come down here because we want to celebrate you. And so I want to encourage you. This year is getting ready to end. We're getting ready to start a whole new year, 2008. I cannot believe 2008 is here. Before you know it, those little kids will be graduating high school and you will be old and some of you will be dead. For real. Some of you are going to die soon. 
than you think. Don't let your life go by without giving God the best you can give him. Don't let that happen. John Wooden was a, co- is a, was a coach for UCLA. He's 90-something years old. How many of you have never heard of John Wooden? Okay, he's a, ooh, wow. He won like 10 national championships, something like ridiculous like that, at UCLA. Unheard of. He's 90-something. He's 93, 95. It really don't matter. He's over 90. <laughs> and someone said to him, are you excited about the rest of your life? He says, man, my, my life, 80, 90-something years is gone. I am so excited about my future. He's so excited about his future. Your best days are, behind, are ahead of you. Your best days are ahead of you. But they can really be good if you let God have them. My, I am in preparation for 50, to turn 50, which I'm going to turn in two and a half, less than two and a half years. So I'm getting ready for that, laying a foundation for that. And then from 50 on, it's going to be like on steroids, metaphorically, okay? <laughs> Pastor Miles on steroids, let's do an investigation. <laughs> He's taking human growth hormone to make his sermons more powerful. <laughs> Everybody's on steroids now. <laughs> but, but I'm looking for a, the future. God has a future for you that is incredible, but you have to make a decision that you're going to do your part. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And I am not on steroids. I'm laughing because I know someone's going to call and say, I heard you on steroids. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make my neck bigger so I can speak louder. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that you are our kinsman redeemer. We thank you that you came in the form of a man lived and died and rose from the dead. We thank you that you did it, that we may be redeemed to you, that we may be born again, forgiven and cleansed. Dear Jesus, there are people in this room who really, really want to have a purpose bigger than themselves. They really, really do want to be about your business. They want to know why they are here. They want to have vision and faith and courage to rise above the average, the everydayness of life. If you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, whether it be for salvation, or whether it be to be committed to him, just pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. But as you pray, you must believe and have faith that he loves you. That his plan for you is real, it's powerful. You must have faith that he's excited about having a relationship with you and that he's ready to get started. So in the privacy of your heart, just pray this prayer with me. Pray, dear God, I do know you love me. I know you have a plan for my life. I know you are my kinsman, Jesus, God in the flesh. I know you died for me and rose from the dead. I surrender my life to you. Be my, my master, my Lord, my God. I surrender my life to you, God. Thank you. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand up. By standing up, you are acknowledging, yes, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer, just stand to your feet and acknowledge his presence in your life, your commitment to him. 
Acknowledge the fact that, yes, you are surrendering your life to him. God bless you. 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 Very good. Stay standing good. God bless you. God bless you. We see you in the balcony. We see you in the stadium seating. God bless you. God bless you. Some of you are sitting and your heart is pounding and your mind is racing and God is going, what are you waiting for? What else has to happen? You need to almost die. Stand to your feet. Acknowledge Jesus in your life. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. Come on. Come on. Today is the day of salvation right now, right here. It ain't going to happen at school. It ain't going to happen at the mall. It's right here. This is what you came here for. God bless you. 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 Very good. Very good. Grab your girlfriend, your boyfriend. Grab your husband, your wife, your kids and stand up. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Good, good. Good, very good, good. We got a minute. Very good, very good. God bless you. 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 Now we're going to ask all y'all who are standing to do one more thing. In a minute, we're going to ask you to come down to the altar. If you are in the lobby, uh, in the balcony, all you need to do is turn around and walk up, and the ushers will tell you what to do. So as these people come down, as we welcome them into the family of God, we're going to ask you all to come out of your seat, and let's give them a hand as they come on down. Come on down. Let's give them a hand. Who's the man? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good. Stay right there. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, let's keep encouraging them. God bless you. 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 Amen. Amen. Come on, let's keep it. Let's keep clapping for him. Come on. Come on. Hey. See, Daddy. Amen. Give me a hand. How you doing? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. All right. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who's the man? <laughs> God bless you. Girl, let's give these people a hand. Come on down. <laughs> Amen. If you um, look around you, you will see people of all kinds. Why? Because we're all sinners and we all struggle with the same exact thing. No matter what shade you are, how much money you have or don't have, how much education you have or don't have, we all are sinners and we all are in need of God. And if you want to see more sinners, just turn around. There's a whole bunch of sinners sitting behind you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen? I had one lady came and say, I don't like you calling me a sinner. I said, well, it is what you are, so, you know, it is what I am. Just, we just got to deal with it. But the good thing is that Jesus died for sinners. He didn't die for righteous people. So if you think you're righteous, then you don't need God. But if you know you're a sinner, he's the one that you need to go to, and he is in the life-changing business. He has a plan for your life, and he knows exactly what to do. He is ready for you. Your only job is to obey him. For the rest of your life, you do what he says, and he will take care of everything else. And he will always bless you way beyond what you deserve. I do not deserve to be pastor of this church. I am not good enough. I am not holy enough. When people remind me that, I just tell them what's new. And so if you have something on me, you're wasting your time. Because I, I'm not perfect, don't claim to be, and never will be. But every day I try 
more and more in Jesus' power to be more like him. That's all you can do. And he will always bless you more than you deserve. So whenever you have your prayer answered, don't think you earned it because you didn't. You earned this and he gave you this. And when you get this holy, he'll give you this. That's how it works. Because it's by grace you have been saved and grace is undeserved. You can never deserve it. That's a good thing. It's a good thing because if you think you want to deserve it, it's all about pride. We have to learn to receive. So you have just received something you didn't deserve, which is forgiveness. And if you walk with him, he will continue to bless you with stuff you don't deserve. And your, and your responsibility is just be good with it. Be a good steward with it. Manage it. And honor him with how you use it. That's all you have to do. That's it. That's it. So uh, we want to help you in that process. Um, asking Christ to be your savior is like being married. He is the husband and we are the bride. And he calls the shots. He served us first. How? He died for us. Now we serve him back. Okay? And so we're going to pray for y'all. And then we're going to ask all y'all to walk up this aisle. And, and you're going to go to the wall, make a left. And we have a room back there that we'll try to fit all of you into. And we'll talk to you about what you just did. It's a relationship. Everyone down here say relationship. It's not a religion. You did not join the Rock Church Institution 501c3 nonprofit corporation. You became a member of the body of Christ worldwide, and we are one of the places where those people meet, and we want to help you in that relationship. But if you move, you're still a Christian. You can watch this on the Internet, but you will go to some other church. It doesn't matter as long as they teach this word right here, and you belong to Jesus. Amen? And everything you are, everything you own belongs to him. Your job is to now say, God, what you want me to do with my life and my time? Okay? Last thing, some of y'all have to get rid of some of the friends in your life. And let him decide. The quicker you do that, the quicker you'll be blessed. Some of you have to get rid of the clothes you wear, the stuff you eat, the stuff you drink, the stuff you snort, the stuff you shoot in your veins, the stuff you smoke. He's going to say, no, 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 no. And the quicker you do that, the quicker he'll replace with something better. Take the hand out of the coconut. Amen? And sometimes that rice is a person. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all these new Children's of God, thank you for their faith and their courage. Thank you so much for the opportunity to tell them about you. And I pray you bless them tremendously. May they really, really, really allow you to be God in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give them a stand ovation as they walk out that way. Let's give them a hand. Come on, let's hear